Another week, boys, and another twab. This week at Bungie, we prepare for Solstice of Heroes 2021. It's almost time for celebration. Earlier this week, Guardians pushed back against the Endless Night. The relentless overrides and adventures to expunge the Vex network, Kyora was found and deleted. While larger threats to humanity remain, one can take a moment to breathe and rest easy, knowing that the people of the last city are safer. In the wise words of Saint 14, it is time for celebration. Solstice of Heroes is the perfect moment for that. Guys, we did a breakdown earlier. If you're interested in knowing what's happening in regards to requirements for Sources of Heroes this year, the loot, the rewards, all those things, down below in the description will be a link to that video. As we got not only a new batch of Solstice armor, but also a Solstice weapon, which happens to be a shotgun because we need more shotguns. Yeah. Moving on, Fate Breakers. Raids fall squarely into the in-game space of Destiny, providing aspirational content for fire teams of six to conquer. Once you've climbed the mountain and planting your flag, you may find yourself asking, what's next? Well, I'm here today to let you know that you haven't submitted the mountain just yet. If you truly wish to call yourself a master of the Vault of Glass, you'll be challenged to earn that respect. So beginning Tuesday, July the 6th, Vault of Glass Master Difficulty will become available to all players. Now, how do you enter? When signing in next Tuesday, Vault of Glass will offer a Master Difficulty option to launch for you and your fire team. Now, while there is no minimum power requirement to enter, enemies will be at 13 50 power. So you'll want to earn some pinnacle power and raise your artifact levels before attempting a run. So what can you earn? First up, Master Vault of Glass unlocks the final triumphs required for the Fatebringer Raid seal and title. Once completed, players may equip their in-game title and purchase the Bungie Rewards pin if they so desire. Second, Master Vault of Glass will also introduce Time Lost Weapons to Destiny 2. Time Lost Weapons can be comparable to Adept Weaponry from Grandmaster Nightfalls or Flawless Trials Passages, but offer an additional perk in Columns 3 and 4 for slightly more customization. Interesting. Anything about Adept Mods? Complete Vault of Glass challenges and master difficulty of the activity and you'll be rewarded. Each week will feature a specific time loss weapon for you to hunt, rotating alongside the available challenge. Once you've earned a time loss weapon, you may also purchase additional rolls from the chest at the end of the raid on master difficulty using Spoils of Conquest. Note that these will be at a higher price than normal versions of these weapons. Holy hell. Do Bungie's really nailing the loot grind inside of raids. Now, please note, weekly reward lockouts are shared between both normal and master difficulties of Vault of Glass. That means encounters, challenges, and hidden chests will only award gear the first time you complete them in either activity each week. They must be completed at master difficulty first to earn time loss weapons and stat focus armors. Lastly, armor from master difficulty of Vault of Glass will focus on specific stats, rotating weekly. If you've been hunting a prime zealot helm with higher spike and intellect stat, Master difficulty will give you greater chances for distribution that you're looking for. Now get ready for a fight. This won't be a walk in the park if you haven't dipped your toes into Destiny 2's endgame before. Enemies will be tougher. They'll be looking to put you down with more aggression. A few more champions will be appearing to defend the vault. More modifiers will also be active, forcing you to think on your feet and come prepared. If you're looking to increase your power, make sure to complete your weekly milestones for pinnacle rewards. One way to do that is the Iron Banner. It's active right now, so make sure to complete those bounties for a additional pinnacle rewards as you prepare for the raid. Atheon will be seeing you next week. Good luck to all fire teams as they attempt their first master difficulty raid. Now, I don't believe it's going to be as difficult as day one contest mode. Could be wrong. And of course, it depends on like the modifiers and stuff, how many extra champions they're going to throw in there. So I think if you are under level, it's still going to be extremely difficult. But if you're at level, that's the thing here. You're not capped. If you're at that 1350 power level, no, it won't be a walk in the park, but I want to say it'll be better than challenge mode day one with contests. Now, as far as the time loss version of these weapons, again, they've got like a different look to them, similar to the same look as the adept weapons have in the Nightfalls. What's going to be interesting is if we can actually slot adept mods on these weapons. When I go look at Light GG, it doesn't even show us a mod slot on the time loss page. So this is something that's being hidden right now. Also, will master working these weapons net the same benefits as adept weapons, meaning will we see that increase in all of our 
stats outside of our masterwork stat. Either way, these weapons are more incentive to grind Vault of Glass. Nothing here about Vex Mythic class being buffed though. Like I was under the assumption considering that master mode is more difficult, wouldn't Vex Mythic class have a higher drop chance? But nothing was said here. I put out a tweet, nothing was said about it. So I'm under the assumption that the drop rates for both the normal version of Vault of Glass and master mode will be the same for Vex Mythic class. Regardless, there'll be a comment down below that I will update in case that question is answered. But the main warning to take away about everything here that we just discussed, don't do normal Vault of Glass and think you can go into master mode Vault of Glass and get time lost weapons in a given week. Once you get the loot through the raid, that's it. You're locked out for that week. So I would highly suggest, especially in the beginning, as we're trying to unlock time lost weapons for all these different raid weapons to just do master mode every single time. And hopefully the loot incentive is just going to be enough to keep us in master mode here on out. Now, moving on, we have Shifting Sands mid-season sandbox update. This has been the most updated sandbox in a single season I have ever seen. Over the last few seasons, we've seen some pretty big changes to the Destiny 2 sandbox. Aggressive hand cannons jumped into the spotlight of PvP. Rocket launchers became an awesome option for PvE content. Dead Men's Tell starting whistling in the wind and much more. Over the last few months, the team has been working to prepare a mid-season sandbox pass, much larger than the ones we've shipped in the past. To give you all the details, Weapons Future Lead Chris Proctor has once again agreed to lend some time to the TWAP. So from Chris here, hey all, Chris here, I'd first like to set some expectations. Normally, we wouldn't make large changes in a mid-season patch, but with a handful of weapons sucking all the air out of the room, we decided to bring some changes originally planned for Season 15 into next week's update. We'll follow this up with a big set of changes in Season 15. Moving these changes up to Season of the Spicer also gives us the option of doing some reactive tuning in season 15's mid-season patch. All in all, we'll continue to make changes outside of seasonal updates when we can, but they won't typically be this large or numerous. Oh, dude, I'm starting to get excited. So without further ado, the big ticket items for PvP are no surprises. Shotguns, 120 round per minute hand cannons, and Dead Man's Tail. Combined, these dominate all forms of PvP, particularly trials. We've also been getting large amounts of feedback about special weapon usage in the Crucible, and this will be a first step towards addressing these player concerns. Okay, we can't forget about Sleeper Simulant and PvE too. Oh boy. Okay, fellas, let's keep it together. Special weapons, let's see how bad it is. Intended special weapon roles in PvP, most special weapons should have one situation where they're a dominant choice. If caught outside, of this, you should be at a disadvantage. Moving towards these roles is a work in progress. Some weapons are not where we want them to be, and we made some changes in Season the Spicer that we expect to need more adjustments later on. Note that special ammo abundance in PvP distorts these roles, allowing play that wouldn't be possible otherwise, and is something we're looking to address. So first, here are the roles we attend each special weapon to fill. Sniper rifles, engaging at long range with aiming skill when not already under fire. Shotguns, engaging at point blank range, using skill at movement or positioning to get close enough to get a one or two hit elimination. Fusion rifles, engagement at mid range, but with careful positioning and pre charging around cover required for success. Trace rifles, strong at close to mid range, at the cost of not being a one hit elimination, making it possible to be outplayed by skillful primary users. Grenade launchers, useful for weakening opponents, getting damage around corners with bounces, or getting a one hit elimination with a direct impact at the cost of projectile travel time and being in a bad place if you miss your shot with a single round magazine. So let's talk about some weapons. So first up, shotguns are very dominant in PvP by any measure and don't allow much counterplay with primary weapons, particularly close range primaries like sidearms and SMGs. We see frequent player feedback about their prevalence in PvP activities and how they make it difficult to use various weapon archetypes that otherwise feel good against players without shotguns. We want them to excel in a narrow niche than they do currently. So this change aims to retain the reliable one hit elimination, but at closer range and push them to be slightly rangier than currently at getting two hit eliminations. As with our intent for all special weapons, if a player is caught out of position with a shotgun, they should be at a clear disadvantage. So with the ability to quickly follow up rising in importance, we expect faster firing shotguns to eat into aggressive shotgun dominance and other special weapons to be more viable. Okay, okay. So 
things like rapid fires or even lightweights. Reese Walker may be a good option with Assault Mag. Now, the sandbox changes themselves. They increase aggressive frame shotgun cone angle from 4 to 4.25 degrees. They reduce shotgun damage fall off minimum by 2 meters. They also increase shotgun damage fall off max by also another 2 meters. Note, slug shotguns are unaffected by this change. Holy hell, it's going to be a slug meta. Like, don't get me wrong. Will I use rapid fire shotguns? Absolutely. We'll give them a go. But if slug shotguns are unaffected by this, chaperone, duality, even your legendary slug shotguns are all about to be incredibly nasty as they're not being touched at all. Either way it goes, it won't be until next week when we're actually testing things out where we'll be able to narrow down which archetype is feeling the best for us. Because again, rapid fires is obviously the best when it comes to doing follow-up shots. However, by default, they have some of the worst range. So maybe specking a lightweight weapon with assault mag may be the play. Now moving on to 120 round per minute hand cannons. 120s were adjusted in season the splicer, but this didn't make enough of a difference. We believe that they're still too rangy and benefit way too much from a small damage buff to tapping. It's tricky because they're now not much different from their pre-beyond light form. They already had better range and could two tap with rampage, but people have latched onto their ease of two and two tapping potential since the buff in beyond light and new 120s in season the chosen encourage people to try them out. With this change, we expect other primaries to become viable where previous 120s ate their lunch, including adaptive hand cannons, pulse rifles, scout rifles, and auto rifles while allowing 120s to keep the advantage of hard hitting peak shooting at range. So the sandbox changes, reduce precision damage multiplier from 1.8 to 1.6, preventing 10% damage bonuses from allowing two tapping in PVP. All right, so things like rampage with just one stack, those God row igneous hammers that you got, no more. Reduce aim assist minimum fall off distance by one to two meters depending on the range stats. So we're also getting a range nerf and reduce damage minimum fall off distance by one meter. This reduces their damage fall off advantage over other hand cannons to one meter and noted next to it as usual, this is one meter before the zoom scaler. Okay, to just break that down guys, essentially damage fall off, it had, I didn't even know this, but it had a fall off advantage over other hand cannons. Now it's gonna be steeper. So not only are we getting a range nerf, but when damage fall off begins, it will be steeper than what it was before. And it's gonna be doing less damage in its precision damage multiplier, resulting in perks like Rampage, not necessarily being useless, but not nearly as potent as it's been inside of PVP. Again, I just wanna take note that this is only affecting PVP, or at least the damage nerf, the range. Well, that looks to be everywhere. What this is actually going to do, and I think this is going to happen with the inclusion of Loud Lullaby. We don't have many 120 round per minute hand cannons with perks like Kill Clip. And we saw last week with Moon Weapons and Dreaming City Weapons being reissued, Loud Lullaby will have Tunnel Vision, meaning it's a possibility Loud Lullaby will have both Tunnel Vision and maybe Kill Clip, which would absolutely be a meta combination for any weapon, but especially 120. Regardless, is this enough to rein it in? with other hand cannons, most notably 140s. When we're talking range here, 140s at the high end, Paladrome, high range stat, range finder, you're talking like 36 and a half meters. A max range Igneous sits at about 39, 39 and a half meters. And my true prophecy with decent range and range finder sits at about 41 and a half meters. So you're gonna drop the range down on those one to two meters, depending on the range stat, as well as more severe damage fall off and the damage nerf, maybe, maybe this is gonna make a difference. Again, I think the damage drop is probably going to be the most significant thing here. Because again, aggressive hand cannons, one of their biggest selling points is their forgiveness. The ability to land a kill with one crit, two body. This drop in its precision damage is most definitely going to require two crits, one body. So again, the range and its nerf, subtle, but the damage nerf, that's going to be the significant kicker. Which is why I think we're going to see 140s, at least amongst hand cannons, take over again. Now moving on, we also have a few changes to perk. First up, Drop Mag can no longer roll on new drops of weapons. We'll have functionality change later. Okay, then. There's a change coming next season that requires adjusting this and some perks with similar functionality. More on that later. Pulse Monitor. Fix an issue where the handling bonus was no longer applied. Rewind Rounds. Fix an issue where the perk would not trigger if the last shot in the magazine was missed. Oh, I thought that was intentional. Or if the player reloaded another weapon before firing the final shot. Reservoir Burst. We've seen some complaints that the detonation on kill 
Ghost doesn't feel that reliable or impactful. So this has been updated with the same consistency and speed fix as Dragonfly. Good. I always thought it was because it pushed the enemy. Like when I would actually do a fusion rifle kill, it almost seemed like it pushed the enemy back and the entire impact of the explosion would miss those surrounding enemies. Now two exotics will also be getting some tuning. Oh boy. Dead Man's Tail is dominant on mouse and keyboard, receives frequent critical feedback from players in the crucible and is strong, but not worrying so on controller. We're keeping the fast firing in hip, which we believe is key to the feel of the weapon. But with this change, it will no longer have ADS level of damage fall off while hip firing. And so will be subject to fall off much closer. It will also require better aim to land hits while hip firing. We're deliberately only lightly touching ease of use in this change with the goal of not making it harder to use on controller. So first, we're removing hip fire damage fall off scaler was 1.8 times to match zoom. Also, aim assist cone angle hip scaler reduced from 1.5 to 1.2. That's actually pretty significant. It's interesting though, they say that they're only trying to target mouse and keyboard players, but this seems like something that's going to target both mouse and keyboard and controller players. Now, depending on what its hip fire zoom is going to be, is going to be the deciding factor of how consistent this gun remains at range, at least in its hip fire form. I have no idea what the multiple is. They didn't say it. They just said it's not going to be 1.8. If it's 1.0, like just a base multiplier, it's still very significant. And I don't believe it's going to be like 1.5. I guess whatever the base hip fire multiplier is for most weapons, although this is not a value I have at the top of my head. Regardless, is this going to be enough to rein in Dead Men's Tail? Perhaps. I, I think the damage fall off could be pretty severe to the point where you have to aim down sights. And the moment you do, the weapon turns into a 120 round per minute scout rifle, which definitely lengthens that time to kill. Again, when you shot from the hip, it had that increased rate of fire, which is why for mouse and keyboard users, we would just run around hip firing with this weapon with little to no downside. Obviously a more difficult task for controller players. Regardless though, this is definitely something we're going to be testing immediately next Tuesday. Now Sleeper Simulant. Sleeper didn't receive any custom tuning when we updated linear fusion rifles, but because it has much higher body damage than other linear fusions, it didn't benefit as much as intended from the global buff to precision damage scaler. Sleeper will now be a clear winner for single shot linear fusion rifle damage, as well as edging out other linear fusion rifles for burst damage and largely match others for total damage for reserves. Also note that Sleeper's penalty for hitting the body rather than the head is much lower, giving it an edge in real world damage. So first up, fix an issue where Sleeper Simulant was benefiting less than other linear fusion rifles from Season of the Spicer's linear fusion rifle precision damage buff. Total buff is now 16.5% compared to 15% buff other linear fusion rifles receive. It is interesting that this wasn't touched. I honestly think this is going to be a go-to weapon for Master Mode Vault of Glass. We'll probably even try using it inside of Grandmaster Nightfalls. Regardless, Sleeper, especially with the Catalyst, is going to be a meta, and I mean a meta option. Now, the near future, we have more changes than usual for a season coming in season 15. Some as follow-ups to the above, and others that were too large for mid-seasons. Here's a preview of some of the changes. Of course, also expect a new batch of weapons and perks. So starting with fusion rifles, we've been wanting to tackle sub-family differentiation for a while. So we're planning on a large rework of fusion rifles, changes to fusion rifle perks and mods, and custom tuning to most exotic fusion rifles. Is Vex Mythic class a fusion rifle? Let's say yes. Breach grenade launchers. With the above shotgun changes, we expect other special weapons to increase in usage and believe that grenade launchers have the potential to become more frustrating to play against as they become even slightly more common. So we're planning a small change that specifically touches priming and cleaning up targets. I actually think they're probably going to remove quick access sling. Scout rifles and hand cannons and PVE. Players have wanted these weapons to be a bit more efficient in PVE for some time. We found that minor enemies in high-end content take too many shots to kill with each of these weapons. Machine guns and PVE. Through playtesting and player feedback, we found they're not doing their intended job well enough. So we're planning a noticeable change for season 15. Probably going to be on the level of like rocket launchers and linear fusion rifles that overall blanket buff. We'll probably see one of those for machine guns. Now, special ammo economy, particularly inside of PvP. While the above changes to shotguns should help tone down aggressive frames a bit, we've got a couple of small changes planned that should reduce the amount of special ammo floating around to a degree and have further changes in mind in case they're needed. Interesting. They brought this up in the podcast. I actually think they're going to remove scavenger perks, but we'll see how that plays out. Now, Anarchy has done too much, too well for too many years. Oh boy. Without even counting the boost, it's gotten this season, which is due to the sweet grenade launcher artifact mods, we're making changes that make it great at a couple rolls rather than being the jack
back of all grenade launchers. God dog it. I knew it. Anarchy's getting a nerf. Now, exotic primaries. We want to give players more reason to use their exotic primary weapons in high-end PvE and have changes coming to help with this. Oh, all righty. Exotic primary buffs individually outside of its archetypes? Well, all righty then. And the more distant future, we'll keep a close eye on special weapons and we'll make adjustments once we see how they perform in the wild, particularly fusion rifles and grenade launchers. We have an idea of what may need more adjustments as these changes shake out, but we'll wait to discuss them as our plans solidify. We also keep a close eye on feedback on exotic weapons and which weapons are under overperforming. We have some tweaks planned next week in season 15 and beyond, which should shake things up. Note that we specifically look at Catalyst as a way to buff underused exotics. For example, this is why we make Catalyst for Trinity Ghoul and Deathbringer. So expect similar reasoning moving forward. Dude, I can name a number of exotics that need some Catalyst with a lot of love. Now at the risk of being vague, we also have long-term plans to address the issues of exotic orb generation and kill trackers without making a Catalyst for every exotic in the game. Alrighty then, so something separate to give us a tracker for all of our exotics and orb creation. Interesting. And there you have it. As Chris mentioned, this is a bit of a meaty mid-season update. While the patch note list isn't the longest you've seen, the impact of these changes is expected to be higher than usual mid-season patches. Don't expect changes of this scale in the middle of every season, but the team worked hard to get these together and out the door. Trying some of these changes out in playtest has been fun, and we're expecting a bit of a shakeup to the meta, at least in terms of shotgun usage. Some shotguns will still be fairly lethal, but will require closer ranges for those sweet one-hit eliminations. As always, we'll be watching your feedback as these changes go live and planning changes as necessary. Whew, fellas, that is beefy, man. Yes, a lot of changes coming next Tuesday. Like, I want to do hard mode raid immediately, but I think I'm going to test these changes first. I just got to see it for myself, right? I got to see the shotguns and 120s and Dead Man's Tail. They've been wrecking the inside of Crucible for so long, I just won't believe that they're nerfed until they're actually nerfed. Now, moving on to another patch note preview. Alongside the Sandbox update, we have a slew of bug fixes going out with Destiny 2 update 3.2.1. Here's a quick list of some high priority changes to expect next Tuesday when the patch hits your hard drive. I'm not going to go through all these bug changes, but these are the changes that are coming. Bug fixes, momentum control. They're actually decreasing trace rifle damage in momentum control. Wow. Okay. I guess they were too hot. Interesting. I thought it was pretty fun. Some other things though, they're fixing an issue in which slow duration from withering blade did not increase with whisper of durance fragment equipped. Also Stormcaller Warlocks can now iron and blink even while being slowed by stasis. Guys, that is your patch note preview for 3.2.1. This will be going out next week at 10 a.m. Pacific and should be concluded by 11 a.m. As a final note here from DMG, earlier this week, it was remarkably warm in our neck of the woods. Felt a bit like mercury outside. I was sweating harder than I normally do in PvP. Thankfully, coastal winds made their way to the city of Seattle just in the nick of time. Planning to spend some time in Iron Banner this weekend. Hopefully the temps stay a bit cooler so I can focus on getting my pinnacle bounties done in prep for Master Vault of Glass runs. Good luck out there. Cheers, DMG. Guys, that is your TWAB today. It was a longer one than usual, but it was juicy. Thank you so much for coming here, though. Again, if you want to check out our Solstice Breakdown video, down below in the description will be a link to that video going over all the details of that next week. We'll be testing all these sandbox changes live, so feel free to come by our Twitch channel. Fellas and ladies, thank you all for coming and watching, and as always, slap that like button like your mama told you right.